In 1965, three incredible engineers decided to work in secret without the knowledge of their boss to build a car that would set the tone for every supercar going forward and essentially create the supercar as we know it. Every single modern supercar can be traced back to what these three incredible engineers did back in 1965. And they were all in their late 20s. And I'm talking, of course, about the incredible, groundbreaking, and beautiful Lamborghini Miura. This is a 1969 Lamborghini As a car, it was flawed, but as a concept, it was truly a masterpiece. Before the Miura, there were fast cars. Before the Miura, of course, there were beautiful cars. But there was nothing as outrageous as this. The man who designed its gorgeous body was just 22. What were you doing at 22? Lamborghini is an interesting company because it was never created to build supercars and especially not to build the off-the-wall supercars that most of us know Lamborghini for. It was created by Ferruccio Lamborghini to essentially do what he didn't feel Enzo Ferrari could. You see, Enzo Ferrari built his cars purely to pay for his racing cars, and that is essentially how the Formula One team was built. Racing on a Sunday was far more important than building cars on a Monday for Enzo Ferrari. And after buying a few of Enzo's cars, Ferruccio Lamborghini got quite annoyed about the amount of time he was spending getting his car fixed. And therefore, he wanted to make more efficient, more reliable, and more luxurious grand touring cars with his own brand on them. And he crested those with his family name, Lamborghini, setting out to be the Rolls Royce of Italy. It never quite got there, but it did lead to something magical. You see, he had set up a challenge to one of his staff, Bizzarini, to build a V12 engine that was more powerful than Ferrari. And he did make a V12 engine that was far more powerful than Ferrari, but unfortunately it was very, very powerful only at the top end, at around 9,000 RPM great for an F1 engine, not so good in a grand touring luxurious car. And after building the lackluster but pretty 350 GT and then the more refined 400 GT, he asked one of his engineers, Paolo Stanzani, to go away and turn the V12 into something more refined and more fitting of a GT car. And Stanzani definitely did work on that engine, but instead of building it for a GT car, him one of their test drivers and mechanics, Bob Wallace, along with Jean Paolo Delara, set about creating something new, something spectacular. And in a company like Lamborghini, where they were mostly left to their own devices, they were able to do this, but decided not to show anything to Ferruccio until they had something that they thought was worthy, because they knew it wasn't what he wanted. And they set about building a frame for a light mid-engined sports car. And boy, did they go crazy with this thing. And there was one key issue. These three engineers wanted the car to have a great weight distribution, something that is the holy grail for supercars and sports cars. It's why people want them. It's what makes them handle so well. And to do this, they wanted to put the V12 obviously in the mid of the car. Unfortunately, the Lamborghini V12 was absolutely enormous. And if they were to run it from behind the driver all the way out, the car would no longer be a small, light, mid-engined, perfectly distributed supercar. So they looked to an interesting source of inspiration. Yes, that's right. The first Lamborghini supercar was inspired heavily by the Mini Cooper. You see, in 1959, in order to save space, the Mini team had gone ahead and turned the engine sideways in order to have it take up as little space as possible at the front of the car and leave more and more space available for the passengers inside. And the Lamborghini trio decided to take this exact idea and cram it into the back of a tiny frame for what would become the Lamborghini Miura. And at that point, they had done all of this and crammed it in to an incredibly lightweight chassis 
and rolled it out to show Ferruccio the new P400, which was its codename. Ferruccio wasn't sold on the idea, but thought to himself, at the very least, this incredible engineering feat is nothing short of a brilliant marketing piece. And he figured that this would be a great way to sell his 400 GT. So they packed up the lightweight chassis with the engine crammed into the back and rolled it to the Turin Auto Show. And there it did exactly what Ferruccio thought. It was a perfect marketing example. And it caused them to get 10 orders that day, more than they had garnered in the entire lifetime of Lamborghini to that point. Unfortunately for Ferruccio, those 10 deposits and orders weren't for his 400 GT, but for a rolling chassis with a crammed engine in the back. And it didn't even have a body yet. So this was both an incredible opportunity and a real problem. Luckily though, Ferruccio and the team knew just who to go to, and they called up Bertone, the famous design house. And they sent over one of their new rookies, a man who I believe was on his second day at the job, a man who you may be aware of, Marcello Gandini. Marcello Gandini did the first sketches of the car within one week, Two weeks later, he had the car mocked up, and only two months after they brought him on, they had a full prototype. And a year after, they had shown up to Turin with that basic metal framework and a crammed engine. They went to the 1966 Geneva Auto Show with Gandini's incredibly designed body on that frame. And it was a massive hit, garnering 30 orders for the car. And the problem they had now was putting it into production. And the Mura put Lamborghini on the map. It was an incredible piece of work and it caused even Ferrari to take notice. Every supercar after the Mura would go on to be some semblance of the Lamborghini's design. Of course, first they had to fix a lot of issues. For example, if you were going on a high speed banking, you would lose oil because it would all swash to one side and the car would literally seize up at high speed, which happened to one of its customers who wasn't that bothered and asked for it to be rebuilt and then did it again and asked for it to be rebuilt again. The cars were known to have issues with being flammable. And every now and again, the carburettors would spit petrol onto the hot engine and the whole thing would go up in flames. Good. But of course, all of these things were absolutely forgivable when you think that the company who produced this produced it when they only had 78 staff, over half of which were production line workers. The Lamborghini Miura was simply incredible. And the people behind it who were in their late 20s had shown what they could do to the world and went on to do even more incredible things. Paolo Stanzani ended up running Lamborghini for Ferruccio up until it went bankrupt in the early 80s. Gianpaolo De Lara, you may be aware of, especially if you watch Formula One or have seen me shout about Haas, went on to form De Lara, a company that is known the world over as an engineering company in motorsport. And of course, Marcello Gandini went on during his time at Bertone and beyond to design some of the world's most incredible cars. Not only the Contash, but also various Alfa Romeos, including the Montreal, one of my favorites, and some more normal road-going cars that you may not think of Gandini in the same breath as. For example, the first VW Polo and the original 5 Series from BMW. On top of this, he was the man behind the Renault 5. The Lamborghini P400 Mura project was the perfect example of what happens when three incredibly talented engineers are given more or less free reign inside of a company and get so engrossed in what they can achieve that they go far further than anyone could ever expect. It's one of the things that was amazing about Formula One in the 70s and 80s, teams like Williams who had very little resources managing to take the fight to the big guys. And Lamborghini is the perfect encapsulation of that with the Mura. They should have 
under no circumstances been able to compete with Ferrari. It was an understaffed team with three guys in their 20s funded by a tractor mogul. But they did. And that incredible engineering is what makes the automotive world so interesting. Subscribe.